This is going to be as long as my last presentation. <laughs> no, it won't. Uh, I'm allowing Don to make up for giving me the hook there by helping a disabled guy. See, this is how you do it, you know? Um, Max Cleland and I have some things in common. And uh, in our youth, we were both basketball players. And uh, we were both badly wounded in Vietnam. We both have master's degree in, in history. We're both vet center advocates. And we're both from the South. Max is from Georgia, and I'm from South California. <laughs> 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 yes. Max Cleland is a disabled veteran of the Vietnam War, and despite catastrophic wounds sustained in Vietnam, Max has led a life of a true American patriot. I suspect in many ways it is because of those wounds that he has been able to do these work, not just, not just as a result of. He's an author. He's been at the, at the fore of Georgia state politics, been a U.S. Senator from Georgia, served courageously on the bipartisan panel investigating the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He's uh, an administrator with the Obama administration, secretary of the ba American Battle Monuments Commission. And for us in RCS, he was the administrator of the Veterans Administration that gave us our program. He's also written a recent book, which I was reading last night, and it is wonderful. He talks there where he, how he battled his own demons of war and utilized that experience to help other vets and their families. That's the Vet Center way. That's what we do. I give you a patriot, Max Cleland. I'm Max Cleland, and I approve that announcement. <laughs> I want to confess to all of you uh, something that's confidential. You're used to handling confidentiality. For the first time, I want to announce that I really wasn't wounded in Vietnam. I just went duck hunting with Dick Cheney. <laughs> I am from the South. I grew up in a little town called Lithonia, Georgia. And uh, when I was growing up, we only had three churches. We had the Baptist Church, the Presbyterian Church, and the Methodist Church. And on a still summer night, you could sit out on your front porch. This was back before air conditioning came to the South and brought us a bunch of Republicans. <laughs> and so we would sit out on our front porch on Sunday night and listen to the various congregations begin to break out in song. The Baptists would be first with that song, Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown? The Presbyterians would respond with that hymn, No, Not One. <laughs> and the Methodists would conclude, That will be glory for me. So it was a very interesting time in which to grow up. Uh, the first time I ever heard the story uh, was in my little hometown. It was the story of the three couples that died and went to heaven and before St. Peter and the Baptist couple was first and uh, he said, you know, who are you? And the Baptist couple was, said, well, you know, uh, I'm Sam and whatever and uh, what my wife's name is Penny. And so St. Peter said, pity, 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 you've worshipped money, money, money all your life. Uh, you know, you're in the wrong line. So the Presbyterian couple was second and said, uh, you know, my wife's name is Sherry. And so St. Peter said, uh, Sherry, 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 you worship liquor, liquor, liquor all your life. You're in the wrong line too. And so the Methodist said to his wife, said, Fanny, I guess we're in the wrong line too. So <laughs> I shortly thereafter joined the Methodist church <laughs> and went to a little school called Stetson University down in Deland, Florida. Well, Stetson did two great things for me. They let me in and they let me out. <laughs> but during one of those sophomore classes on theology, I found it interesting. 
to find out how many various religions uh, and uh, seemed to appeal to higher authority in various ways. The Baptists, when they wanted to appeal to higher authority, said the Bible says, and Presbyterians, when they wanted to appeal to higher authority, said, you know, John Knox says, and Catholics, when they appeal to higher authority, said, you know, the Pope says, and Episcopalians, when they appeal to higher authority, said the prayer book says, and Methodists, when they appeal to higher authority, said, seems to me. <laughs> so I wanted to share with you a little bit uh, how it seems to me. My first reaction seeing all of you here uh, is what a difference 30 years has made in the right direction. What a difference. The first time I checked out a potential vet center, vet center number one in Van Nuys, California, was that part of the South. Uh, was uh, in the late 70s with two young men named Shad Meshad and a guy named Bill Mahady. Shad Meshad went on later to uh, found a Vet Aid Foundation in Los Angeles, which still is in operation today. Bill Mahady is very sick with cancer in San Diego. But those guys came with that little a shopping center in Van Nuys, California, and said, that's going to be it. Now I'm thinking, where? <laughs> they said, right over there. So that's how the Vet Center program got started that way. But there's a little more background to it that you should know. I was once on the staff of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee since I had no other job opportunity at all. I worked for $12,500 a year. And I drove my own car to the Senate office building and then wheeled up to the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. In those days, there was a freshman United States Senator from California named Alan Creston. At the end of the Vietnam War, declared officially in 73, in one sense, due to the withdrawal of the troops there. In 74, Cranston launched and introduced legislation for something called the Veterans Readjustment Act. Based on the fact that in California, so many Vietnam veterans were coming back to that state and staying, but they were winding up on the streets. So street counseling centers sprang up, swords to plowshares, and a number of others in California. Cranston got that word and thought the Veterans Administration ought to handle that. Now, I knew Cranston because I had testified in, in, in December of 1969 when he was a freshman state, a U.S. Senator, when he held hearings on the treatment of Vietnam veterans by the Veterans Administration. So I had testified before him once. I worked on the staff of the committee. But then I had the opportunity, literally, of a lifetime when I became head of the VA at the age of 34 when President Carter got elected. March 2nd, 1977, I was sworn in as the youngest administrator in those days, that's the term, administrator in those days, of, of the Veterans Administration and the first Vietnam veteran. So we were all focused by this time on what in the hell to do with all these millions of Vietnam veterans coming back, showing signs uh, of, shall we say, something with, that hadn't been officially categorized by the VA yet. It took till 1978 when the Veterans Administration itself recognized and authorized compensation for something called post-traumatic stress disorder. If you go back, if you read a little bit of Jonathan Shea's books, um, Achilles in Vietnam and Odysseus in America, both of which uh, John McCain and I have written forwards to, if you go back, he says, you can see PTSD or the aftermath of war and the struggle with that, even in, even in Homer's writings. So PTSD has been with us as long as war has been around. But this country hasn't actually focused on that until the Vet Center program came into being. 
I would like for all of those in the audience who were with the original vet sitter program and our original vet sitter people to stand up. We want to recognize you, those who have been with the program from its inception. Thank you. And 30 years is a long time. As I look out at you, I think, Lord have mercy. Never did I ever envision the sense in which an entire magnificent room full of counselors would be on the face of this globe. But we have that now because not only do we have the aftermath of the Vietnam War, we have the aftermath of other wars, and now we have new wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. War, it seems to me, is life on steroids. It rushes up life, and it rushes up the tragedies of life. It was Ernest Hemingway who put it very succinctly. And the reason I'm a Hemingway fan is because he went to war. He got wounded in war, World War I. After which, about 10 years after his, his war, 1929, he wrote a book called A Farewell to Arms in which he said, the world breaks us all, and after it, many are strong at the broken places. I felt that I had to talk to myself, and if somebody else wanted to listen, that was okay. So I started a writing project just to talk to myself, basically, in 1975. And for five years, I worked on a book that I later titled Strong at the Broken Places. Some of you have referred uh, the fact that you have read it. Thank you. Now, Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms has sold a hell of a lot more books than mine. I want you to know that. But I think that you all and me all and all of us as Americans should be involved in helping those who go to war and who survive it to come home and get strong at the broken places. <laughs> war can take it all out of you. I don't care how prepared you are. I don't care which war you find yourself in. War can take it all out of you. It can take away everything that you thought you knew about coping with this life. I know that. It can take away your life. We know that. But if you survive war, it can take away also your will to live. And I know that too. It can take away parts of your body. And I know that. Many of you know that. It can take away your sense of justice, your sense of safety and a number of other things with which you have to deal. Now the good news now is that no veteran from any war in America has to deal with those issues by themselves anymore. They have you. As administrator of the Veterans Administration in the late 70s, I find it, as I look back, very insightful that the Veterans Readjustment Counseling Act from the beginning included two things that I think are absolutely critical. First of all, that is the only veterans benefit that I know of that includes families automatically. Secondly, although health care information is generally considered confidential. The confidential nature of the counseling program or the discussions or the rap groups or the sharing in a vet center program is absolutely essential. More and more we are seeing now, as you all are learning, that the vet center program is not just for veterans, shall we say, anymore. 
It is for more and more active duty personnel in a series of endless wars which Iraq and Afghanistan personify. And now Guard and Reserve, since they are treated as active forces, are now beginning in, in many ways access to the Vet Center program. Well, it's interesting too that Shad Mishad, who helped put together the program, the initial program, and I've given Al Batras some of the interesting history in that regard, was called upon a few years ago by the Soviet Union to deal with uh, Afghanistan veterans from the Soviet Union's incursion into Afghanistan. So this is not just an American problem or a DODVA problem, it's a worldwide problem. When people run up against trauma and they experience total helplessness and total powerlessness, you never ever forget it. Whether it's war or whether it's a seismic earthquake or whatever. But you all are specialists in something that the world needs more and more, and especially here in America. What is a vet center? What is the uh, series of elements that lead to an individual getting strong, even at the most broken places of their lives? I've thought a lot about it, and a lot about it recently, because after 2002, after I lost, uh, I look at my, my own life. Jimmy Carter and I uh, were retired from politics due to illness. The voters were sick of us. So, uh, I went into my own massive, deep, dark depression where I did not want to live. I had lost every sense of a coping, uh, or every sense of having a coping mechanism left to me. And I came to a point where I did not want to live. I found myself, quite frankly, even though I had gone to a vet center from time to time, back in trauma counseling at Walter Reed uh, for about three years. I found myself on medication. I found myself writing another book. And so um, what I've learned is, is several things. First, uh, I think it is critical to tell the story. The Vet Center program allows a wounded spiritually and emotionally and maybe sometimes physically veteran or family member or series of family members to talk confidentially about their story. If one can somehow process enough and communicate enough and share enough about their own story, somehow as screwed up as that story initially sounds, as things go on, as time goes on, believe it or not, there is something that happens inside the brain, inside the psyche of an individual that says somehow this shit is making sense. It's, it's, called, it's called talk therapy, but it's much more than that. I mentioned Ernest Hemingway, but another of my favorite authors is Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl survived the death camps in World War II, and he came back and wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. That search for meaning is something I think we all undergo. But if we have been subjected to trauma, war, powerlessness, helplessness, and all the other tragedies of life, the search for meaning becomes absolutely crucial to our survival. We must find some kind of meaning or understanding that is acceptable to us in order to survive. Frankl puts it this way, to live is to suffer, he said. To survive is to find meaning in suffering. I'm on the American Battle Monuments Commission now. I'm the secretary of the American Battle Monuments Commission. I wondered how in the hell I could ever be a secretary, a government secretary at that. You know, I can't type and I don't have pretty legs, so what the hell <laughs> is this secretary stuff? I don't understand it, but I got the title secretary, so 
The, but but I, I learned that in World War I, Archibald MacLeish, who later became Librarian of Congress and a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, wrote about his younger brother who was killed in World War I, now buried at Flanders Field. And he said at the end of the poem, the poem was called, The Young Dead Soldiers Do Not Speak. And at the end of the poem, he says, we leave you our deaths, give them their meaning. So for all of us, we have a search for meaning, especially if we have been to war. Because war itself has a sense of conveying a powerful meaninglessness about life. If you think as I have often done as a Vietnam veteran or an Iraqi veteran or an Afghan veteran, that somehow there's a growing sense of meaninglessness about your service and your sacrifice, I ask you to tune in every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for the HBO series, The Pacific, and see the horror, literally the horror, of the Marine Corps trying to tackle these Japanese infested islands. The most recent uh, episode was about Iwo Jima. If you want to see true slaughter, watch that series about Iwo Jima. If you want to see slaughter before that, watch the Marines try to take Peleliu. Peleliu became a non-significant island after all of that slaughter. So one can easily end up with the attitude about war and about life of Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. What the fuck? That's where we come in. That's where you come in. First of all, tell the story. Tell it over and over and over till you're so damn tired of telling it that it begins, um, um, amazing enough, to make even a little bit of sense to you. Secondly, have a loving relationship. Now, the group itself can become your higher power, your meaningfulness, your sense of power in the world, your sense of loving, your acceptance of love. Now, I have a friend who came back from Iraq, combat medic. He got into every kind of trouble that you can get into. Alcoholic, and he was in the VA system in Texas for a while. Drug addiction, he was in a drug addiction uh, program for a while. Jail time, six months. So let's just say this gentleman was not exactly slated for success. But he found a cat in the pound. True story. He put that cat on a leash. And that cat became his buffer with society. He has massive PTSD, if you really want to call it that. He cannot cope alone against the elements in life. And this cat has become his new favorite loving best friend. The cat was recently hit by a car, left for dead. He gave a fundraiser for the cat at a local bar, which he frequented, raised over $2,000, got the cat well, and they are still doing their business in Austin, Texas. So there is a loving relationship between the cat and the owner. This friend of mine went into Social Security and was going to apply for Social Security. True story. And as you well know, when a veteran runs up against bureaucracy, you know, and wait a minute, Vines, uh, in terms of office stuff, uh, there is not much patience there, let's just put it that way. So this guy was about to climb over the desk and strangle one of the people at Social Security when the cat looked up to him and he got the message, it's time to leave. <laughs> Whatever works. Telling the story helps. A loving relationship helps. And doing something for someone else outside yourself. Some of us get hooked on that. I was hooked on that. Politics became my outlet my way that I turned my pain into someone else's gain. 
Now, I was a little asshole for a lot of that period of time, I'm willing to tell you. But I tried to do some good along the way. I can tell you right now, looking back over 40 plus years of public service, the Vet Center program is the best thing that I ever put together. And there's a wonderful man now who had a career in the VA, Jim Mayer, and now with the Wounded Warrior Project, who's here today with us. And I understand Bob Putnam, who was back, back in those days in the late 70s with us. Uh, people like that, Shad Mishad, Bill Mahidi, Jim Mayer, Bob Putnam, Gowling Michael, a whole host, Dean Phillips, a whole host of names, Alan Cranston, President Carr. There, no, no, nobody, nobody does all this stuff by themselves. It really does take a village. Any real effort requires a team, as you know. And so success uh, is really uh, achieved best by a team. I've gotten a lot of credit for the Vet Center program, and I'll take it. <laughs> but but, but uh, in reality, it was a great team effort. We started out, by the way, with that little Vet Center in Van Nuys, California. Now you've got well over 300. We started out with just 15 little vet centers and uh, just a few handful of counselors. Uh, now they're well over 1,400 and soon to be more. So tell the story, loving relationship, try to do something for somebody else. Whatever outlet works for you. Now if you think that sitting in a rap group you know, is just doing something for yourself, yeah, I get that. If you think a 12-step meeting is just doing for something for yourself, yeah, that's why you should go. But the truth of the matter is that there comes a moment in all of those uh, 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 circles where you shut up and let somebody else talk. I'm still in a 12-step group on Tuesday nights in D.C. It's, it's a bunch of people there, very successful people at one time, but all of whom have crashed and burned in one way or the other. Alcoholism, drug addiction, depression, failure in terms of life or just life breaking you. One way or the other, we're all in recovery. We're all brothers and sisters now. We all paid the price of admission, which was too high normally. <laughs> but we got there. Um, but there comes a moment when you have to shut up and let somebody else talk. And the amazing thing about it is when other people began to talk and tell their story, it's helpful to them, but it's helpful to you. And at the end of the meeting, you wind up realizing that maybe something you said actually did help somebody else. You don't go there for that, but it happens. So you find yourself as part of a group, as part of a team in which you share and they share and you listen. One of the great things that I've learned, believe it or not, as someone who likes to talk a hell of a lot, is to shut up and listen, believe it or not. And I find that I end up doing things for other people and not even aware of it, not even conscious of it. But there I am. So you realize that your life begins to take on a little meaning even accidentally. You don't start it out that way, but it may end up that way. That's God's stuff working. I really do believe it. Tell the story, have a loving relationship, even if it is with a cat on a leash. Get out of yourself somehow. Do some kind of work, some kind of effort that benefits one other human being on the planet. It will give you more meaning and purpose and direction than you ever suspected. So many of you are here today because you came to the Vet Center program maybe just as a work study person and you're going to get the hell out and go back and do something else. But you decided to stay. You found certain fulfillment here. And those of you who are, shall we say, new to the program, are new to the, to the vet center world, it is a family. I find it fascinating uh, that Al Batras, one of my heroes, has said that this is the program in the Veterans Administration that is best liked by the people in it and best liked by the people it serves. There's something good going on here. Some good going on. Tell the story. Have a loving relationship. Make sure that you try to do a little something for somebody else. And have a sense of humor. You know, 
I don't think I picked up a sense of humor until I absolutely had to. <laughs> that was back about 1968 at Walter Reed in something they call the snake pit where they put the young officer amputees. Minimum award for heroism there was a silver star. We had one guy there with a DSC. All of us had lost something. All of us were young tigers. As the book says, young eagles made into a movie. But we were young tigers. And I didn't really have a real sense of humor until I absolutely had to. Now in those days it was relatively gallows humor on the ward. Uh, it had, but it had a cutting edge to it, you know. There's a reality to it, but then you try to make fun of it. Uh, sometimes borders on gallows humor. Uh, we realized that the superior officers at Walter Reed knew us better than we knew ourselves. They did not allow two things in the snake pit. This is true at Walter Reed in 1968. They did not allow chaplains or young nurses. <laughs> Believe, we believed in one, but not the other. You can pick. One time on ward rounds, just to break the tension, somebody put a blow-up doll, a plastic blow-up doll, in the bed, an empty bed, put a sheet over it, and put some stockings on the end of the... That was a, a long day. <laughs> Another time, the guys in the snake pit saved up their drugs and oranges and apples and stuff. And when the little night nurse with her tray of good night boys sleeping pills came in, her name was Ms. Weekly. Can you imagine that? <laughs> the guys rolled all that stuff under her feet. She spilled all that. So the, the orthopedic surgeon goes to the two-star general at Walter Reed and says, we've got to do something about those boys. And the two-star says, sir, what do you suggest we do? So all of us had to pick up some sense of humor and laugh at stuff that we all, all of us mostly had to create because there was so much darkness around, so much a sense of loss, so much a sense of being overwhelmed by war and what had happened. Don't forget a sense of humor. It will help you through many days and help your wonderful veterans and their families through many days. I have a friend of mine who is a, a humorist or a comedian or whatever. He's professional at it. He's good at it. And I talked to him on the phone recently about something else. And he always had a, has a couple of one-liners for me. He says he didn't watch the Canadian Olympics, the Olympics in Canada. He said if he wants to see somebody going downhill fast, all he has to do is look in the mirror. I heard one the other day that I liked very much about the elderly lady who goes to the doctor and she says, you know, doctor, my husband is not performing. And uh, so he says, well, give him a little Viagra. I said, well, he won't take that stuff. And he said, well, here's just a little bit, just slip it in his coffee. So two weeks later, she comes back. She says, oh, Jesus, you know. And he says, what's wrong now? She says, I put it in his coffee. And boy, he began to perk up, he, you know, he's alert. And all of a sudden, he just nailed me right there on the table. And she said, he, the doctor says, what's, what's, what's wrong now? He, he says, we can't go back to Starbucks anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> Do I hear some amens out there in the audience here? <laughs> Milton Berle, who I got a chance to meet once before he passed away, said that laughter is an instant vacation. Laughter is an instant vacation. If you can, if you or get, or, or, or the people with whom you deal, if you can get them laughing, you're halfway home. Laughter indicates a certain perspective. Norman Cousins, many years ago, when Jim Mayer was my executive assistant in the, and I was head of the VA and we, I met with Norman Cousins, through laughter, he dealt with a serious illness for many, many years. He used to watch, watch Marx Brothers movies. They don't turn me on, but they turn him on. So just laughter, pure laughter, somehow does something 
uh, to the body, mind, and spirit. It gives you a sense of perspective. And that is what we're all struggling for. A sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, struggling to, to get a little perspective on what's hurting us so badly, what we can't figure out. Whiskey, tango, foxtrot. And that's what you're doing. You're leading people to getting strong at the broken places. What a special, special mission. I really do believe that you all are hooked on this. I'm hooked on it. And I hope you stay hooked for as long as you want to be hooked. This is a family. This is a special, special operation. This is a special organization. I came across a little reading that I think I will share with you. Um, we often hear the term heroes in our business. You're a hero, they're a hero, whatever. And it's often said in military terms. But there's all kind of ways in which to be a hero. I believe in heroes in, in life. I believe uh, in heroes in the military. I really do. Especially in combat and when, when the pucker factor is just overwhelming. People do extraordinary things. But then there's wonderful people like you all who just day to day, day in and day out, show up and do the right thing. One of them is Charlie Walden. Charlie Walden and I met by accident 42 years ago. He was a young Marine on a hill. I got off a helicopter. I turned around. There was a grenade. It went off. Charlie Walden was the third guy to me. He only spent a couple of three minutes. I was bleeding, dying, laying there. He thought I would be dead. It was only 30 years later that we ended up finding each other. By then, I was trying to find out the details of the incident. And uh, Charlie said, but you're missing the bigger picture. I said, what bigger picture? He says, well, after I attended to you as the third guy to you on the field, he said, I completed my tour with the Marine Corps. Later became an Air Force B-52 bomber pilot, did special missions. But he said, you know, they don't let you fly a B-52 bomber pilot, a be a B-52 bomber pilot having PTSD. <laughs> he said, a vet center in California saved my life. He got out of the Air Force, went to get a master's degree in counseling, and is now up in Duluth, Minnesota as a veterans counselor. He saved my life on the battlefield. Years later, through creating the Vet Center program, I helped save indirectly his life. And now he's with you out there saving other people's lives. So I'll leave you these words. This is the way I feel. It's a comfort to know there are heroes among us. Regular people, just like you, willing to do what they can to make the world a better place. Heroes give instead of take. They act instead of talk. They step forward and do the hard and unseen jobs to give the best of themselves, measuring their own success, not by wealth or comfort but by the lives they touch along the way. That's what heroes do. You're those people. Maybe you don't think of yourself that way, but that's what you are. And I just want to tell you how grateful I am to know you and to know that there are heroes like you in the world. God bless you. On behalf of the uh, Vet Center program, let me thank you from, you know, every one of these human beings, they work every day to do what you just described. We want to thank you because if it weren't for you, we wouldn't be here. And your influence on, on the VA administration is everlasting and we just want to give you a token of our appreciation from the heart and I hope you come back and visit with us periodically because 
Not only do we respect you, but we love you, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.